Hello everybody and welcome to this webinar session entitled Synergizing Real Impact with Your Research to Support Quality Education for All. I'm Sharon Parkinson and I'm a Publishing Development Manager at Emerald Publishing and I will be the host for today's session which focuses on the work of three Emerald Young Research Award winners who have been recognised for their research and in particular the impact and positive benefits it has on the community. As a leading social science publisher, Emerald is passionate about leading change and we align much of what we do to many of the um, UN Sustainable Development Goals. So to support this, we publish research that influences thinking, that helps to change policy and positively makes a difference to lives beyond the walls of academia. One of our mission-driven goals centres around quality education for all and it's a goal shared by our experts on the panel and it's what really brings us all together here today. Now, before I hand over to the speakers and introduce them, I do have this housekeeping slide to quickly run through. So as you can see, the, um, there's a yellow, sorry, an orange arrow on the right hand side of your panel, and that will open and close the control panel so you can change some settings there if you need to. However, everybody has been muted. Um, there's a questions um, little drop down box in there. So obviously, if you have any questions as we go through the session, please put them in there. Um, the presentation is being recorded and it will be shared after the event. And we're also going to be making some relevant articles that have been authored by our speakers today um, available after the event. So again, look out for those when we, when we send a follow up email. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So our speakers are three people who have so far had very interesting and award winning careers and I'm delighted that they're going to be sharing some of their highlights with us today. They are Dr Chun Sing Maxwell Ho who is a lecturer in the Department of Education Policy and Leadership and Research Fellow of the Joseph Lau Luen Hung Charitable Trust Asia Pacific Center for Leadership and Change, and that's at the Education University of Hong Kong. Maxwell's research interests include teacher entrepreneurialism and school leadership education. He has conducted school-based middle leadership and entrepreneurial teachers training programs in local schools since 2019. Our second speaker is Dr. Donny Adams, and he is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Education, University Malaya. He was awarded the University Malaya's Excellence Award for Community Engagement in 2019. He's actively involved in research and development work towards the area of inclusive school leadership in Malaysia. And he has led research projects with the British Council, with ETH Zurich, the Head Foundation, UNICEF, Asian Universities Alliance and Teach for Malaysia. And our third speaker today is Dr. Yi, Yi Hua Lu who is an Associate Professor of Educational Management at the National Taipei University of Education. And she's also a Research Fellow of the Asia Pacific Center for Leadership and Change. Her research primarily focuses on leadership, organizational change, and network improvement science. She has led research projects supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, MOST Taiwan, New Zealand Ministry of Education, Jacobs Foundation, OECD, and the Sailing Wen Foundation. So welcome to all our speakers. We're delighted to have you join us today to talk about your impact-driven and, of course, award-winning work. The session will last for one hour, and we'll hear from each speaker in turn for about 15 minutes, and then we'll open up to questions for the final 10 or 15 minutes. So as I mentioned earlier, please use the questions box in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen to submit your questions as we go along. And if the question is directed at a specific speaker, then could you please be sure to mention that the name of the speaker? We will try and address all the questions at the end. However, it will depend on how we do for time. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Maxwell. Are you OK, Maxwell, to load your slides? Sure, sure, sure. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, my turn, am I right? Let me present it. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, that's my pleasure to present uh, some of my work to all of you. I hope that uh, maybe in the future we can collaborate to see uh, how we're going to bring the real impact to the societies. Uh, actually, today topics is about um, how do I going to promote teacher entrepreneurism to the societies? Uh, uh, you can see that there are so many names in my PowerPoint. Uh, I know that uh, some of you may know these people uh, because just, just like uh, Professor Adam Walker, okay, uh, they are very important people that uh, in these impact journeys for me. That's why I praise them right here and they are the team members uh, for my project. Uh, today's session is very simple. Uh, let me give you some very sim simple background about why I'm going to promote the teacher entrepreneurism to the societies. Uh, it is very interesting that in Hong Kong, uh, our chief executive is going to say, um, we had to uh, enhance the teacher professionalism standard. And then that's why uh, the government going to uh, release the new teacher standard. And there is one item going to mention about teacher entrepreneurism, uh, the so-called apprentice. And then at the same time, they say that if you wanted to be a senior teacher or to be the leader at school, you have to have this kind of spirit. That's why they are going to ask all the teachers to have some training. But very interesting that um, I noticed that even the government going to promote these things, the teachers have to fulfill 90 hours training, okay, to learn the concept and how to bring impact to the societies. And there's so many teachers are waiting for this kind of training. Uh, of course, I know that uh, Hong Kong is a very small society, and then that's why I, maybe you will say that, okay, you only got uh, 50,000 something teachers in Hong Kong. This is not, a, this is not big enough, but um, we are going to serve many students at the same time. And then uh, we study a different kind of uh, program in Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong universities, uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong and the other universities, we find that we do not have this kind of program to promote what is teacher entrepreneurism. And this is the background. This is what happening in Hong Kong. We are going to say, okay, we want the teachers to be more entrepreneurial, but at the same time, we do not have the training. So what happened to me? Uh, actually, uh, I completed my doctoral degree in 2018 or 19, I, I forgot, sorry. And then, and then after I completed it, and then I published a paper to conceptualize what is teacher entrepreneurism. Actually, uh, I choose this to topic is very straightforward because um, I got the teacher award in uh, from the Hong Kong government when I served in a secondary school. And then I bring up some new initiative to the education sectors. And then turn out, I think, that, okay, I had to do something for the society. That's why I wanted to be a scholar. Then I conduct a study and then conceptualize what is teacher entrepreneurism and then publish in the journal. And then I'm quite lucky that uh, my publication are accepted by the education admin administrations and then also the PCC. And then after I conceptualize these things, my head of department, uh, Dr. Darren Bryan asked me, okay, you should share the ideas to the people because they don't, they do not have any ideas about what is teacher entrepreneurism. So I conduct a forum and then I, I don't know why, maybe this is because it is a brand new concept to all teachers and principal. Turn out I draw 400 people come physically to listen to my explanation about what is teacher entrepreneurism. Then, uh, let me share some ideas first. Otherwise, maybe you will, you will have no idea. Oh, what, what is teacher entrepreneurism? That's very simple. Teacher entrepreneurism is about that a person who have a set of competence and attributes that uh, help them to seize the educational opportunities and scale up their innovative initiative at school or even in the educational organization. And then most likely people will have uh, free competence and free attributes. And then they are going to think about, think about how going to perform these kind of competence and attributes to build up a team and work with the people and then make their a kind of dream come true, okay, to help the student. Then uh, I, I guess uh, 
because of that impact of that forums, uh, so many principal make a phone call to me, say, do you want to come to my school to do some training? I wanted to invite you to train up my teachers. But I know that I cannot do it at, at once. Otherwise, um, it's just like a talk that we all know that talk, the effect of uh, conducting a talk is not very good enough. That's why I'm going to uh, pilot my training first. I invite four, four schools, two primary school and two secondary school. And then their principal uh, choose some leaders for me. Then I train them up. And then it is an in-school service. I go to their school regularly to uh, explain the concept, do some training exercise, and then apply it in leading their teams. And then this is the way that I do. And then the feedback is quite good. At least their job satisfaction and trust increase. And every teacher have some new initiative in their school. And then because of this successful experience, uh, at the same time, I'm quite lucky that I got the Outstanding Doctoral Research Award also from Emeralds. And then uh, uh, it, quite lucky. Uh, but I, 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 I had to say that the, the mirror should go to my supervisor because my supervisor is very smart, uh, Dr. Darren Brand. And then he guided me to do this physics and then turned out I got the award. And then based on my award, my experience in training the teachers in four school, I conduct the other uh, forums. And then in that forum, uh, the other lucky things that happened. Uh, I met the founders of DHL, DHL International. And then uh, he really interested in teacher entrepreneurism. Then he said he wanted to donate $1 million, uh, Hong Kong dollars, okay, not US, okay, $1 million to me to scale up my training. That's why I'm going to launch the other training program in 2020 and 2001. And then, uh, we, we, we first limit to 16 schools, but turn out we got 18. And then here is the data. You can see that uh, we scale up. I want to I take these opportunities to polish my training program. And then also turn out we have a really good experience. Uh, and then we try to confine these things into a booklet. Of course, uh, uh, the school going to share their story to the local school. And then we send this storybook to hold all the teachers in Hong Kong. And then thanks for this $1 million. And then uh, then we share the experience through the webinar. Of course, uh, so, so many principal come to know what happening. How come there's so many teachers and principal come to find us to, to this training? And then at, actually you can go to scan this QR code, then you can take a look to our booklet. We will publish the other booklet uh, this year. And then after that, we, we find a training and then conduct the other one. And this time uh, we got 53 school application, but because of the limitation of my capacities, we train up 21 school only. And then uh, it is quite success, uh, but I had to say that uh, we still need to figure out how to make sure our impact is directly connected to the student, to the teacher teaching and learning. Because most likely we right now are going to train up the teachers to bring up the new initiative. It can be in the classroom, in the pressure cares, but how that it directly connected to the student learning, we still figure it out. And then that's why in the next year, uh, we already have uh, 14 schools that enrolled it, and then we limited to 14 schools, we do not accept it anymore, okay? And then we try to see how teacher entrepreneurism directly related to the teaching and learning, how to enhance the student performance as well. And then uh, here is some information about my training. And I would say that uh, yesterday, one principal talked to me, say, Maxwell, I enrolled at your program three years already. I'm looking forward for the fifth and sixth. So this is the other encouragement for us that to think about how to scaling up with varieties. I think it is very important for the scorer to think about how to keep on polishing your theory and to improve your service to the societies. And then that's why uh, I don't need to explain more about myself, but I wanted to take these 
a few minutes to appreciate by our team members. I, what I wanted to share is that a successful program is not because of your, your own abilities only. It's about your team members. That's why without Dr. Darren Bryan and Dr. Ori, they are the person that keep on give me really good advice about polishing the concept of teacher entrepreneurism. And then Dr. Darren Bryan is my supervisor and Dr. Ori is a very famous scholar. And then he is the external examiner of my doctoral study. And then we are friends now. He keep on give me different kind of advice. And then when I going to decide the program, my associate head, Dr. Lu Jiefang, and of course, our former faculty dean, Professor Aaron Walker, give me really good advice on how to decide a good program that to bring the real impact to the school. Because when we're going to come up with the idea, most likely we were going to present our ideas to the audience only. But they keep on reminding me that the audience are teachers. They wanted to know how to apply it. Then that's why with their advice, I keep on polishing and then try to make sure that all the things can be on ground, can be granted softly, to make sure people can going to use our theory to decide their school initiative and bring real impact to the student. And then uh, I guess this kind of program turnout can beneficial to uh, according to our survey, uh, to the teachers in the past few years, uh, to the school, uh, according to our calculation, uh, there is 110 initiatives that we bring up in school. And then for the education bureaus, uh, we try to work with the government and they are very generate, uh, generous that uh, they invite us to share the ideas to the government as well. And of course, uh, we based on the workshop and the training, we collecting the data, and then based on this collecting data, we now uh, have four papers that under review, and hopefully we will publish it soon. And then I guess this cycle will be beneficial to the next one of our training uh, teachers. And then I guess uh, this is my sharing is about 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maxwell. That was really interesting. And it sounds like you're working with the dream team there. And I think that probably, you know, goes a long way, doesn't it, in terms of a success of a project, um, having having good networks and good support within the institution as well. Um, very ambitious plans there from the Hong Kong government, too. Um, and, and touching on the impact side, I think what you said about, you know, that is a, a major challenge, isn't it? Measuring the impact is is a real challenge. Um, but it sounds like you know you're well on the way, and I think it will be um, it will become quite obvious actually what the impact has been once this is you know and scaling up again is another issue, isn't it? And um, but yeah, that's really fascinating. Thank you so much, Maxwell. Thank you. Okay, all right. So our next speaker now is is Donny. Are you are you okay to share your screen there, Donny? Hi, Sharon. Hi. A very good afternoon okay. here from Malaysia, and a very good afternoon to all our audience. Um, let me go ahead and um, share my screen. Okay, here you go. Um, are we good, Sharon? Yes, we are good. Okay. Um, so, very good afternoon, everyone. Um, Donny Adams from Malaysia here, and thank you for joining us um, in this uh, webinar on synergizing real impact with your research, um, especially to support quality education for all. So I'm from the Faculty of Education, University of Malaya, and um, please allow me to take 15 minutes of your time to share about what are the sort of real impact um, activities and projects that I'm doing, particularly in the context of Malaysia. Um, so the first thing I, I feel that is important is for us to understand what it means uh, by real impact. Um, so when we talk about research impact, real impact is about the effects of research that is felt beyond academia. And we were talking about how can we share this knowledge that is generated by our research and how could we contribute this knowledge that has been generated 
by our research, particularly to the benefit and influence of the society, culture, our environment and economy. And if you could see here, uh, there's a nice diagram here that talks about, uh, this is us in academia, uh, in, in the university context, and we do lots of research here. Uh, but the idea is how could we transfer the knowledge that has been generated, the findings and implications that have been generated from the unity context to the society. And we can see that there is this wall, there is this barrier here, because often this barrier here is the one that prevents the knowledge sharing between university and society. So we, the idea is to actually to break off this um, invisible barrier that we have so that whatever knowledge that is generated from the research can be directly felt uh, within this society. And for me personally, I very much love what Charles Koch has said, that doing research is about um, creating value in the society. The effects is felt within the society. And when we do research, um, the research projects that we do, real impact happens when it's connected with the sustainable development goals. Um, we need to see societal impact in the research that we do. And as much as possible, uh, we try to connect our research with as many sustainable goal, um, sustainable development goals as much as possible. So let me share with you about uh, what research I conducted in the first place. So there was a research that I conducted on uh, student readiness for e-learning during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this was done in a Southeast Asian University here in Malaysia. And what we found from this research is, firstly, um, our students are very much ready for online teaching and learning. And also as much as the COVID pandemic caught us by surprise that institutions had to immediately migrate to an online platform, but our students are very much ready for online teaching and learning. But here's the case. We did another research and this research is on blended learning engagement. So we wanted to see that, okay, our students are ready, but how engaged are they in the online teaching and learning? Being ready is one thing. Being engaged in the lessons is another thing altogether. And what we noticed that, um, here's the case, our students are actually having very low levels of engagement in online activities. And we talk, we look at their cognitive aspect, we look at their emotional aspect, we look at their behavioral aspect, and it's quite alarming for us to discover that they are actually having low levels of student engagement. And this is what we needed to do. We needed to see that, okay, these are the findings, our students are ready, however, they are not really engaged in their learning, um, especially in aspects of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral. So what do we do? Um, this is a very important findings, and we cannot just sit and, and, and just um, be happy with what has been published. So we needed to do something, we needed to impact the society, and we came up with this project called uh, Microsoft Innovative Teachers Train the Trainers. Now, what is this project all about? So first thing, the research that we did was focusing on students. So we found students are ready, however, they're not really engaged in their learning. So we needed to capture, we needed to do something, we needed to impact the society, and our target was the teachers because Classroom instruction starts from the teachers and the teachers are very much the inspirational person behind an engaging and a very positive uh, classroom environment and classroom instruction. So if the teachers do not get this right, then it contributes to low student engagement. So we developed this project called Microsoft Innovative Teachers, but there is an element of train the trainers here. So what was this project all about and how is the element of train the trainers uh, apparent in this project. So let me run through you about what is the initial knowledge transfer to the community that we invented in this project. So first thing, we wanted to train uh, primary and secondary school teachers on the integration of Microsoft 365 education. And this is basically focusing on the learning and teaching process in the classroom, specifically in online classrooms. Secondly, we wanted to expose our teachers to Microsoft 365 education technologies and resources that supports uh, specifically the integration of blended learning. And this is very much in line with uh, the 21st century skills that's needed by our students and uh, very much in tune with the UNESCO ICT framework for our teachers. And when we say train the trainers, what we did at the initial phase was we selected 
20 schools to be part of our project. Now, specifically in each of these schools, as what you can see in the slides here, these are Malaysian schools, um, both primary and secondary schools. We selected one teacher trainer from each school because the idea is to train this teacher trainer. And what happens is this teacher trainer will in turn train their teachers in the school. So this is where the concept of train the trainers came. So we journeyed with these teachers for about three months, teacher trainers, about 20 of them for three months. And in the whole process of this, uh, we are giving them a very specific title, uh, Microsoft Innovative Teacher Trainers. And here you can see that these are all the 20 teachers that is very much part of our program. And we are still very much in touch with them um, until today. And they all come uh, from the 20 schools that we have selected and I've showed you earlier. Now, what happened here? Uh, from these 20 teachers, we actually had a training modules with them. So these are training modules that we have developed specifically from the research that we have undertaken. And we want to see what the students actually want. Why are they having low engagement and what specific things that triggers or stimulates their engagement in learning? So we developed these training modules. And from these training modules, we actually train these 20 teacher trainers about how they can duplicate and most importantly, not just duplicate, they can create their own lessons within their own classrooms. And what you can see here are some products of those uh, training. Um, these are posters, training posters of our teachers. When they have developed their own modules because the idea is train the trainers. So we train these 20 teacher trainers and they are supposed to train the teachers in their school. And we have given them a minimum target of at least 10 teachers per school. So what you can see here, there's uh, collections of posters and these are our teacher trainers who have come for the training in the project and they have developed their own modules based on the context of their school, based on the learning interests of their students in the school. And you can see that these are some collections of it. Uh, these are another collections of posters by other teacher trainers. And you can see there are different topics focusing on Microsoft Teams. You are looking at Microsoft Suite. Some are focusing on Microsoft OneNote. And some teachers, they actually combine all three modules together. This is another range of uh, posters. So you can see that they have actually designed. All these posters are designed by your teacher trainers. And the idea is to incentivize, is to capture the attention of other teachers so that they will want to come and be part of this training and upskill their own knowledge in uh, teaching and learning. And what is the project impact? Um, so we did a pre and post. Um, so here you can see specifically before the training, uh, those are the bars in blue. And you can see the mean scores of before the training, these are the scores in terms of using the applications of Microsoft 365. And you can see that in terms of Teams, even in terms of chat usage, and we can see that in terms of using applications such as OneNote, um, Sway, Microsoft Form, we can see that uh, in terms of skills and competencies before the training is kind of low, but what we are quite uh, satisfied about and what we are very happy about is the results after the training. And you can see that the, the, the results after the training, the bars in orange, and you could see that there is a significant increment in terms of their skills and competencies. So in a way, this um, shows us a proof that the program is effective in terms of upskilling their knowledge and skills, particularly in using Microsoft um, in the, uh, Microsoft 365 um, education software. And we have successfully uh, trained not just 20 teacher trainers, we have also successfully trained 214 teachers. So it's a cumulative big impact. So from a small uh, group of teacher trainers, these teacher trainers are now trainers themselves to train teachers in their schools. So we have successfully completed um, 214 teachers and these are some qualitative feedback uh, from our school teachers and they have undergone this training from the teacher trainers that was the product of this project. And you can see that this is, the session was very useful. It was really helpful for teachers to have a fun integrated platform for teaching and learning. It's really interesting for them to learn new things 
and up here you can see a very interesting topic to cover and we enjoy it and uh, among other testimonies i had fun and in all parts of this microsoft training i receive a variety of new information very useful knowledge sharing program is very beneficial and informative the program enable teachers to carry out teaching and learning activities so our idea of impact is not just to transition research from university or academia into the society. Our idea is to ensure that once we leave the project, once the university researchers are out of the project, can the project sustain itself? Can the project be continued? Because the idea of us uh, doing this project is why we want it to be maintained long term. If Donny Adams is out from the project, can this project still continue? Can this project still be replicated and expanded in other contexts? And we noticed that one of the sustainability elements of this project is the knowledge and skills of Microsoft 365 education can now uh, be practiced continuously at no additional cost in the future. And also to add on, we now have 20 dedicated certified Microsoft Innovative Teacher Trainers to train teachers in their schools and the surrounding regions continuously in the, new, in the near future on the integration of blended learning and online learning. So that will be my sharing for this afternoon. And I would like to uh, thank everyone for your attention and your time. And thank you specifically to Emerald Publishing for giving me this opportunity to share a little on the research impact that I do in my community. Thank you. Thank you, Donny. Again, another fascinating presentation. And I think this is a really good example of what you might call impact driven research. So obviously seeing the results from your research has really driven you to go and change things and to improve things. Um, and some really strong results consequently have been demonstrated. And what's nice as well about this is that through creating the champions within the schools, it can flourish and continue into the future, like you say. So, um, so brilliant. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thanks. Okay. So, Yi, okay. Um, so final speaker today is Yi Hua. Are you, are you okay to load up your slides? Yes. Thank you, Sharon. Is thank my slides you. clear? They are. Okay. We can see them. Thank you, uh, Sharon, for the wonderful introduction. It is such an uh, extreme, extremely high privilege to be recognized for my work. So thank you, Emerald Publishing. I'm honored to be virtually sent by besides uh, Maxwell and Donnie, who are doing impactful work in the field. I also want to thank Sharon, Ellie, and the Emerald leadership team for putting together this inspiring event that brings us together from different parts of the world. It is a true honor. And Emerald has been dedicating its effort to make real impact in many fields. And in responding to Emerald's great efforts, I'm doing, I'm going to share some of the studies that use a social network lens to understand how we can use network as a means to get to change at scale. So today, the, the, the title of the talk is Network Learning Ecosystem, Evolving by Design, a Social Network Approach uh, for Systemic Change. I hope my work will connect with the yours in some way. So for decades, um, scholars, practitioners, and policymakers and other stakeholder groups have been striving to find solutions to address this long-ass inquiry, which is how to achieve and also sustain improvement in education. Some have used these improvement approaches that, are, that we are not unfamiliar with, such as PDSC, um, the Six Sigmas, and Leans, etc. More recent movements in the educational research communities call for the use of improvement science in addressing a wide variety of educational issues. And the basic idea is to use data, evidence, or network strategies to find and solve organizational problems in order to pursue its continuous improvement as a system. This approach pays particular attention to the target problems that are need to be addressed, as well as the people who are going to tackle them. While these approaches provide useful insight, they are based on the assumption that organizational developments are problem-based or deficit-based. They start with the question, what is wrong? And then assume that there's a problem or issue that needs to be fixed in order to move on. Um, uh, the problem-based approach is one way to think about change. However, I'd argue that not all change efforts emerge from such deficit-based inquiry. And in fact, many efforts arise from the process of evidence-informed reflective inquiry, including redirecting the sense of purpose and reflecting on the, at the positive core of organizational values, beliefs, and goals, while at the same time being honest with the brutal facts. So instead of uh, identifying organizational problems, I focus on network-informed approach to understanding organizational assets and processes in developing a learning ecosystem in which all stakeholders are involved in the change process. 
So the core of this network informed change process is the emphasis on interconnectivity and inter interdependence among organizational members, which help us understand the shaping of the social system that promote learning and better results and how it may support or hinder the change efforts. The network informed approach has a lot to do with how to use network as a means to get to change at scale. It takes individuals agency to innovate and experiment and also has to be supported with the type of infrastructure um, that can facilitate meaningful connectivity and then use the data and results to make informed decisions for systems improvement. I'm currently writing and editing two books around this idea of network approach to change and improvement. And one of the core ideas of this change framework I propose in these books is the cyclic process, which starts with the setting up a network goal of an organizational system. It can be as large as reform outcome or as small scale as team collaboration, followed by intentional infrastructure design in support of the network goal, which leads to the resulting network structure that can be used to inform the direction of change initiatives. And I'll be using these guiding questions to discuss the following network case studies. I'll be sharing a slice of results based on the network data from four case studies at different levels of organizational system, including the school level, district level, cross school level, and larger regional level. So the first study is about the effect of a network intervention on the change in school's overall network structure. The case is situated at two urban elementary schools in Taipei. Both schools share a lot of similarities, including same school size, location, family socioeconomic status, and both schools are led by a novice principal both aim to create a network of teacher professional communities for implementing a national curriculum reform. The only difference between the two schools is treatment. The treatment school involves a change in leadership style and also receives network intervention. At the treatment school in year one, the principal's leadership style is lazy fair, you know, doing nothing is doing everything. And he believes that during his first year of principalship, it's best for him to observe the way things get done in the school. And, and so he, he, he relies heavily on his leadership team to oversee the school. But in year two, he was more actively involved in teachers' instructional meetings. And in terms of the intervention, it was conducted with all school members during year one. They were exposed to the idea of social networks and were given the opportunities to make sense of their school's network data together with other organizational matrices. At the end of the intervention, they have to come up with the solution to promote meaningful connectivity that works in their school and that can also promote um, uh, how they move forward with the implementation of the national curriculum reform. In the next slide, we'll be looking at the advice-seeking network patterns around how they um, work together to implement the reform. So light green now is a school principal. Red now is our leadership team. Dark blue now is our teachers. It's obvious that the principal's network position is at the periphery of the school network in year one, uh, which is not, not too far from our anticipation because the position reflects the principal's year, first year lazy fair leadership style. But in year two, the principal's eagle network is expanded to include more teachers and administrators in his inner network circle. And so the principal moves to a more central position and is closer to the mainstream of the school's reform network. This is largely because of the change in his uh, leadership style in year two to be more actively involved in teachers' instructional meetings by doing more frequent classroom walkthroughs, informal readings, and also attending the school-wide curriculum development team meetings, etc. Moving principal's network position brings change at the principal's level. However, in order to engage all teachers in change efforts, a school-wide network intervention is necessary. So at the treatment school on the left-hand side, it's obvious that the network connectivity is significantly increased over time. And on average, individual teachers develop a new tie. The network becomes more dense, more reciprocal, with fewer isolates. The principal becomes more central in the reform network. And there are also more cross-role interactions. On the contrary, at the control school to the right, although their network looks more dense than the treatment school, but its network uh, cohesion level drops significantly over time. Teachers are disconnected with two ties on average, which is a lot. The networks become less dense, less reciprocal, more isolates. The principal at the control school remains at the periphery over time. And this initial comparison tells us that the network intervention may play a role in the shaping of the school network structure which helps us understand the extent to which the network goal of creating such network communities is achieved at the treatment school. The next case is a longitudinal research practice partnership project conducted in a mid-sized school district in California and the US. Over the last um, 10 years, since 20, 20, um, 20, 2012, every year, my team and I have been working with the district's leadership team, including all central office and school side leaders to conduct district-wide survey to assess the level of organizational performance in achieving its mission and goal, we would collect social network data along with other key climate measures from the leadership team and also all stakeholder groups, including teachers, students, parents, classified staff, and also all the leaders. 
We particularly work with the leadership team to make sense of the data and annual data reports, and also co-create strategies for improvement. The leadership team plays a very important role in this improvement process because it serves as a reform initiation hub who develops and coordinates uh, reform initiatives, arrange network activities, and help individual schools to make sense of their school data, celebrate their performance, and also decide their directions for improvement. The cohesion of the leadership team is very important, is key in this process. During the early years in our partnership, we have identified areas for celebration and also improvement. For instance, in this network structure of the leadership team, we found that the overall collaboration connections increased for central office leaders and elementary school and middle school principals, which is worth celebrating. However, when we look at the high school principal, uh, which is in those orange notes, they became more and more isolated and periphery over time. This finding is quite concerning when it comes to reform change at the district level. This type of network data is useful in identifying the strengths and weaknesses of the district's social system, which can help us to, can also help the district strategize its reform efforts. Yeah. The information presented in this slide is a snapshot of the data that we use in our reports and in our workshops as we work with the school district, including the systems, uh, network structure, and climate indices over time. And through our partnership work, the district has become one of the four features for its dedication to innovation, partnership and educational excellence. And during the first few years, the superintendent received several national and state level awards. And today, we continued on our partnership and are committed to sustaining improvement efforts together. My work also expands to supporting New Zealand's national educational reform. And one of the recent major policy developments in New Zealand is this one that was released in 2016 called the Community of Learning Policy which encourages schools that are geographically closer with one another to form a community of learning schools and work together towards curriculum reform. We are interested in looking at the degree of collaboration among across schools under this policy context. The study has two phases. The pilot study took place at one at Col A in 2019, including five schools, no intervention involved. The follow-up study took place at Col B, including four schools involving network intervention to facilitate cross-school collaboration. We will be looking at the pattern of collaboration at Col A in the next slide, followed by the network intervention results uh, at Col B. This is a typical Col structure with a cross-school Col lead and school Col lead principals and assistant principals who are responsible for coordinating and promoting cross-school collaboration for their teachers. We would expect to see these leaders working collaboratively across schools to share reform practices. However, this is what the actual collaborative relationships look like among these leaders. What we notice in this graph is that the co lead is connected directly with only one of the five schools, and about half of the leaders are not connected with other leadership colleagues from other schools. Results from the pilot study urged us to conduct a network intervention to see if the cross school ties can be further activated. The intervention is conducted with the co leadership team through a series of online workshops in which the uh, research team worked with the leadership team to make sense of the network data and came up with the solutions to promote, promote greater collaborations across schools. And results indicate that in year one, only two leaders are engaging in cross-school collaboration. But in year two, almost all schools are somewhat connected with uh, one another through their co-leaders, suggesting that the network intervention may play a role in facilitating this cross-school collaboration, which further supports the implementation of the co policy. The final case is about a larger regional interorganizational network that is typically organized by a hub lead. The hub lead is a, is a central player coordinated by a lead university with the intent to engage stakeholders in their region to focus on regional needs and issues. And in this study, the focus is on sharing and bridging resources for STEM education. The purpose of this study is to use network data to look at the pattern of the network uh, and further inform practices that can promote sustainable engagement in the network. The study sample includes 316 organizations and institutions from within a county in California that are organized as a STEM ecosystem with the intention to support STEM education and pipelines career. Um, and bring together um, partners for meaningful collaboration. These organizations represent six different stakeholder groups, including K-12 school districts, institutional higher education, museum, Zoom, after-school program, business industry, and government, and community-based organizations. We invited the representatives of these organizations to complete a survey assessing their relationships uh, with the other organizations within this same ecosystem. The goal is to create strategic collaboration between among our members the infrastructure is the efforts of this network hub in initiating meetings and organizing networking activities. We focus on two network relationships. One is the, the first one is the general go-to type of information sharing relationship. The second one is more long-lasting relationships that can form 
strategic collaborative uh, relationships. These are the cross-sector interactions. Nodes are grayscale by sector. It's obvious that the cross-sector ties are more, much more dense in the go-to relationships than in the strategic cooperation relationship. When we take a look at the, the within-sector ties, the ties are also more dense for go-to relation than for collaboration relationship. Taken together, well, we can see that there appears to be more of a tendency for cross-sector interactions than for within-sector ties. And those ties tend to be surface-level relationships, you know, like the general go-to relationship, compared to the deeper and more intense collaboration relation. This indicates that the pipes for resource sharing and cross-sector supports are in place and activated by almost all sectors, which is somewhat something to celebrate. However, these more intense collaborative relationships are infrequent, suggesting an opportunity for the help lead to put efforts to convert those surface relationships to ones that promote long-lasting collaboration in order to meet the goal of STEM ecosystem. To wrap up today, I start with the idea of asset-based mindset to create a learning ecosystem and why we need to consider using networks as a means to build such a system for better results. Each project and study site has its network goal. For organizations and systems to achieve their uh, set goal, creating the kind of conditions and infrastructure that supports meaningful connectivity and learning is crucial. For almost all my research projects, my team and I work closely with the study sites to build and sustain research practice partnerships relationships and engaging the process of evidence-informed collective decision making. And a lot of them, um, even though we are not um, forcing them to work with us, they are actively um, wanting to work with us in order to help them to see how their uh, level of improvement is. The core idea is to use network as one unique and important evidence, along with other psychometric tools and qualitative data to identify areas that's worth, that are worth uh, celebration and improvement. As organizations work to align their goals with policy and practice, it's important for them to develop a better sense of how networks can serve to support decisions for improvement and eventually help them create a self-organizing and evolving learning ecosystem. And one of the ongoing education movements in promoting the idea of self-evolving learning ecosystem is the Cincinnati U project initiated by my colleague and I, and currently more than 25 countries are involved. The project allows the school's school district to use an online tool to diagnose their school's efforts and performance in making systemic impact. One of the unique features of this tool is this weaving component, meaning that schools have the opportunities to not only share their practices and success stories or challenges, but also exchange insights with other school systems across the globe that are also using the tool, which makes this improvement efforts at a global scale. By the end of the talk, I'd like to leave you with a few questions to chew on when we think about making impact at scale. How do educational systems might most effectively create conditions to support all everyone to engage in learning and change efforts? And what would be the most needed changes to policy and practice to help facilitate learnings for all? We can think about the role and function of networks, intentional design, and the level of change we attempt to achieve when we reflect on uh, these two questions. I hope today's talk is to some extent useful and relevant to some of your research or study context. And thank you, Emerald, for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to share my work. And thank you for listening. I'd be happy to stay connected. Thank you. Thank you so much. And once again, another fascinating um, presentation there and obviously a bit of a dive into the complexities of, of, uh, of networks and but how interventions can actually have a positive effect so that's that's really good and I picked up on the fact that you mentioned co-creation as well with the beneficiaries which I guess is you know really important element of, of this kind of approach okay so thanks thanks to all the speakers they were all really fascinating um, talks I believe we've got quite a few questions now um, so I'm going to try and work through as many of them as possible um, you will also notice that in the chat there is um, a link to a quick survey. So if at some point attendees would be willing to do that, it should only take a few seconds, that would be great. But I think it's going to be also in the email follow-up. Um, okay, so starting off with, um, perhaps if we could have um, the panellists' cameras on, um, and then I can start to direct some of these questions. Um, first one is about impact um, and the question is if impact cannot be measured directly what are the alternate measurements that can be proposed so does anybody on the panel have any suggestions there of how how we might look at impact
<laughs> well, I think I'll, I'll take the first um, crack of the answers. Uh, I don't have the, the, the only one answers, but uh, from my work, I think the important thing is to use all kinds of data that are relevant to the, uh, the goal of the organization is uh, and indicators are, are indicators of how they can look at the impact, the extent to which they are really making a difference uh, compared to what they were um, before the intervention or before any of the projects implemented in their schools or as, uh, as uh, oh. oh, I guess it's a lab uh, that's my That's my take. So in research, I feel we have, we've collected, we've helped the school. We actually work with the schools to uh, design a goal and make sure the goal is clear. And then we, de we develop instruments together. Uh, and then we collect the data together, and then we analyze the data together. We do everything together. So then and we can also train the schools how to make sense of the entire process and make sure that they are, they, they, they understand the process and they can also um, organize uh, every, every detail of the improvement process themselves. So that's my take from my work. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? Yeah, I agree with you are that uh, it is very important because uh, different researchers will have different uh, background, especially you can see that three of us have different focus. That's why it really depends on the project that your project goal. What is the purpose of your impact? And then for, for, for instance, uh, I, I know the reasons why Eva is my uh, head best friend because my head Dr. Darren Brand also conducted the network analysis. <laughs> Actually, we also collect the data of the network in my training yeah maybe we can work together later <laughs> yeah. and then uh just for example for me because i focusing on the leadership training about the teachers entrepreneurism and how do they going to build the teams my indicator is you can see it's about the team trust the teachers job satisfaction how many new initiatives that they bring up and the change of their behaviors then these are the indicator that we measured before and then, and Adam is very practical. It's all about teaching. So it's, it can start really going to measure the student learning performance. So it really mm -hmm. depends on the context and your academic background to see how to integrate it in it. Uh, the main purpose is to make sure echo to your project objectives. Yeah, this is my opinion. Yeah. 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 I think it's probably worth pointing out as well that I think, you know, impact can be quite a scary thing to think about. Um, but it's probably useful to stress that impact doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be enormous. Impact or progression changes, even if they're incremental and small, as long as they're in a positive way, it's still impact. You don't have to change policy with your work. You know, it's all the small things that everybody does collectively that make the big changes. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably worth worth saying. Um, this, the next question is um, also related to impact, actually. How long is the average timeline for a certain project in order for us to measure impact? I guess this is a very, you know, again, it's, it depends, doesn't it? It's, it's so many variables. And I think, you know, certainly from my point of view, um, working with impact specialists, there is no um, set timeline for impact to take effect. Impact can happen at any point. It can happen during the research. It can happen after. It's not necessarily a linear thing. Um, and impact can often happen in a way that you weren't expecting as well. You know, there can be other positive benefits and impacts to your research um, that you hadn't actually planned for or anticipated. Does anybody ha have anything else to comment on that, on the top timeline of when impact might, might happen? Um, Sharon, I, I'd like to add on what you said. Uh, what you've said is absolutely spot on. Um, there is no fixed timeline and sometimes, um, as what you mentioned, um, impact can be something that is unexpected, something that we didn't expect. Uh, one of the situations that I would like to share is uh, there are some instances where the school principals and um, subject head teachers, um, they have actually came across 
um, some of my articles and uh, went through some of the findings and recommendations and conducted trainings within the schools. And I, I wasn't aware that the research articles um, had, such, uh, had such an impact. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a research project that we are doing. Sometimes it, it, it happens in a way that you didn't expect, where you actually are having people who are reading your research work, and these are not just academics and scholars. Um, they could be practitioners reading it as well, and they are learning and gathering information from there and utilizing their findings and information in their own context. And if you're lucky, you, you get to know that, <laughs> that they are, they are using your work in, in, in such a way that I got to know where, uh, because the teacher that was training uh, contacted me and said that she got some really difficult questions and she's not able to answer and said, like, could you come over and um, sort it out for us? So, <laughs> so that's where yeah. I found out that um, the impact is happening in such a way, you know? So absolutely, Sharon, I, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, 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 can't, yeah. we, we can't anticipate a timeline, yeah. Exactly. And you can't anticipate actually being able to measure it all or be aware of it all, because like you say, there could be some um, impact that's happening as a result of your of your research that you're actually not aware of. Um, and I think that's why it's important to really try and reach as many audiences as you can with your outputs of your research. So, you know, the, the articles that you might publish or and trying to actually make them accessible. So a, a, a research paper might not be the best format or medium um, for getting your, your work out there. It could be something like a video or an infographic, something that's much more accessible and that can be picked up and applied by those people who are in a position to actually make the changes. Uh, but then you do have to be aware that you may not ever get to see <laughs> what the impacts are, but still it's always good to disseminate it in the best and most appropriate way and in many different ways. Okay, so this question is to Donnie and Maxwell. How to find a proper funding to bring our research project into society? How to connect with the companies like DHL and Microsoft? So any advice? Okay, I, I, I will take a crack first. <laughs> um, I think that um, first thing is to provide a, a very um, compelling proposal as in what actually that you intend to do, why do you intend to do, and what is the potential impact uh, from that project. And it has to be something that is substantial. It's not something that you know, I, I happened to sleep one day and it appeared in my dream and, and this is what I want to do, you know. Um, it can't be something like that. It has to be something that is substantial, that's based on facts, is current situation, and there is a potential that it has an impact on the society. Now, our funders uh, are there uh, and they are there to invest wisely. Um, so they're not just going to invest uh, just for the sake of investment. Um, for them, they must see that there is a potential impact uh, on the society. So painting a very compelling story uh, in your proposal, supported with research and facts and all the necessary, uh, um, um, shall I say, training needs, for example, needs analysis, all this kind of uh, information really helps. So for me, um, my funding was obtained from Microsoft is because I did a research and I connected that research to a different target group. So my research was on students, but I noticed to impact the students, I need to impact the teachers. And that's where they found that there is a significant point of connection between the teachers and students. And it's best that we work something on the teachers so that um, they could do something on the students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I guess Adam have a really excellent answer to the audience. And I, I just wanted to add a few points that um, it is so difficult for the scholar who study leadership to gain resources to conduct some uh, real impact workshop to the audience because uh, the impact is not quite clear. <laughs> it's not quite concrete. But uh, we, can, we have to identify the needs of our potential audience first. For example, um, in my case, uh, the Hong Kong government going to promote these ideas, but turn out there's no training. That's why so many people seek for that. Then we po we're going to negotiate with the donors and they're so generous. Actually, we use all the money already. 
and then we are now going to fund by the uh, the petitioner. That's mean the school. They they pay for our service, and then because we are going to do something that they need, and of course you have to have a really clear proposal. Uh, just it's the same as what Adam say. If you can find out the market segment, the needs is very clear, and then going to tell them that how do you going to conduct a concrete training for the teachers by using your theory, then and also state the potential output, the impact to their school, then turn out they will going to help you. But of course, I I have one uh, very simple I uh, skills that. I will help the school to apply for the fundings as well. Turn out all the school participated in my program. They all got the other $1 million from the government for uh, authorizing their initiative. That's why many schools will try to find us to support their leadership training. Yeah. 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 So there are those incentives there. Yeah. Well, we are out of time. Um, I think that we've got through most of the questions, which is good, um, but sadly not all of them. So apologies if, if your question didn't get answered, but I think they were all on a very similar theme, actually, the questions. So hopefully everybody's satisfied with what you've, what you've said um, to the questions. So really all that's left for me to say is, is a huge thank you to everyone for joining us today particularly to our wonderful speakers. Um, it's been a pleasure li listening to you. I've learned a lot and I'm sure, I'm, well, I hope that our, our attendees have too. Um, we will obviously send out a copy of the recording. We will send out links to um, the articles, some of the selected articles of the speakers today. So please do, do look out for that. Once again, thank you all. Have a great day and hopefully we will all see you at some point again in the future. So goodbye. Bye. Right. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank Thanks, everyone. I don't know how to Bye, leave. Sharon. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Try to find the leaf. I don't know where it is. <laughs> We're trapped here forever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll end the webinar now. Thank you. Okay, bye. Great. Bye, bye, Rizda. Bye. bye. bye.